When we look at oligopolies that are not colluding with each other, like Coke and Pepsi, you get a very different understanding of how profit uh, maximization goes and really what can happen in terms of their price making power. Keep in mind that Coke and Pepsi are in very fierce competition with each other. They each want to retain the amount of market share they have and each would be more than happy to take something from the other guy to increase their own profits. So let's take Coke as our example. Let's say that the price of a Coke is a dollar and Coke is going to lower their prices by 10% down to 90 cents. Well, law of demand states that if they lower their price, quantity demanded will increase. Let's look at two reasons why quantity demanded will increase. It's possible that some people would start buying Coke simply because it's cheaper. This is what's known as the income effect. But realistically, not too many people are going to buy Coke at 90 cents who wouldn't have also bought it at a dollar because the difference in price, 10 cents, isn't a very significant amount to that many people. So maybe we see five more people buy Coke because of the lower price, but to be honest, that's being generous. What's much more likely is if we see quantity demanded increase by 100, that most people are buying Coke just because it's cheaper than the competitor, Pepsi. Now we're assuming that people don't see much of the difference between Coke and Pepsi, and that's something that we'll talk about more later on. Well, if this is true and Pepsi has just lost a large share of its clientele to the competitor Coke, what's going to happen is the competitor, Pepsi in this case, is going to also have to lower their price by the same amount, down to 90 cents. Well, if this is true, these people who would have switched because of the lower price no longer switch. So all that happens is that Coke, their quantity demanded is going to increase just by the five people who's in, uh, who are buying it because of the lower price due to the income effect. However, if Pepsi has also lowered the price, maybe Coke doesn't even get all five of those people, maybe just two or three. So the bottom line of all that is, is that the demand curve for Coke is very inelastic when price is lowered. And it should follow then that because the demand curve is uh, linear, that the same logic should hold true if they raise their price. However, we're gonna see that it's not gonna hold true. Here's why. Let's go opposite. So what if Coke now raises their price by 10% up to $1.10? Well, a lot of the same logic would be true. Quantity demanded is going to decrease by 100. It could be that five people just can't afford it anymore or choose not to buy it at the higher price. But it's more likely that a lot of people are going to switch over to the competitor that they see as being identical. Why would I buy a Coke for $1.10 if Pepsi is $1? I'm just going to buy the cheaper one. In this case, though, the logic breaks down. Here, the competitor met the change in price, but here, the competitor won't meet the change in price. If you're Pepsi in this situation, Coke has raised their price and a lot of their clients come to you now, you're not gonna raise your price and send the, client, the clientele right back to Coke. You're gonna leave the price where it was because Coke just gave you an advantage. So what we find is that when the firm lowers the price by 10%, they only gain a small number, maybe five if we're generous, of new demanders. But if they raise their price by 10%, they lose a much bigger number, 100 competitors, most of that due to the substitution effect because they'll just go buy Pepsi instead. So then we get this conclusion that if demand is, inel is inelastic when price is lowered, demand is elastic when price is increased. But we don't see that shown on the demand curve. So I'm going to show you something really scary, but you just have to remember this that we just said that price is elastic if we raise the price, I'm sorry, demand is elastic if we raise the price, and inelastic if we lower the price. See, it's pretty scary, isn't it? But it's actually much easier than it looks. What we see is we start with the current price. We said that for Coke and Pepsi, this is around a dollar. So if that's the current price here on the demand curve, we see that if we lower the price, the demand curve is relatively inelastic. But if we raise the price, the demand curve above that price is relatively elastic. We call this the kinked demand curve. Uh, a kink is a bend, so we see a demand curve with a bend in it. And from this, we get an important understanding about how oligopolies operate in regard to their pricing decisions. 
When we draw marginal revenue, remember that marginal revenue is derived from the demand curve above it. So I've taken this vertical line, and that's the marginal revenue curve to the right that relates to the demand curve, everything down there to the right of this vertical line. And it's got the two to one relationship we described before, as long as there's no price discrimination. However, when we look at this vertical line and to the left, this part of the marginal revenue curve is derived from this part of the demand curve. Therefore, it's twice as steep as the demand curve above it. So we get this marginal revenue curve that's broken into really three sections. So you get an elastic section that goes along with that, an inelastic section that goes along with this, and then this vertical section that connects the two. Keep in mind that vertical section is directly below the kink, which is the current price. So we get some important conclusions from this. Remember that if the firm is profit maximizing at this price, that means at this price, the quantity is where marginal cost and marginal revenue come together. So this right here is where we find MR equals MC. So let's go ahead and finish our analysis here and then we're gonna show a change. Remember, marginal cost cuts through AC at its lowest point, which means this is gonna be the average cost here at this quantity and average revenue P1 is above it, P2. So this firm is making abnormal profit of P1 minus P2 times QPM, or the size of this rectangle here. Well, now what we wanna see is if marginal cost change what's going to happen to the non-collusive oligopoly. So this firm, Coke, is now uh, facing increased marginal costs. Maybe uh, the price of fuel has gone up. Uh, maybe they have to pay their workers a little bit more money. Who knows? What we see is that MC and MR, they still intersect at the same place because this is occurring on this vertical portion of the marginal revenue curve. So any change to marginal cost, and I could have moved it left or right as well, or even down, down to this point, any change to marginal cost is not going to result in a change to QPM. What then follows then is that at QPM, remember the price is derived from the demand curve. So since we haven't moved left or right, then we also haven't moved left or right on the demand curve. That is, we're still gonna be at P1. So average revenue for the firm, or total revenue, is not going to change, i.e. they're not going to change the price, therefore they're going to sell the same amount. However, average cost will have changed. Remember, marginal cost has to intersect the lowest point of AC. Well, we already said the lowest point of AC1 is here, therefore that can't be right. So we need a new average cost curve as well. So now we can see that the firm, Coke in this case, is in a bit of a bind. They were making abnormal profit between P1 and P2, but because of the shift of marginal cost, their, average pro uh, their abnormal profit is going to be somewhat taken away. At QPM, we see the new average cost is there, which means now this firm is only going to make abnormal profit of P1 to P2 times QPM. And obviously this is a situation that the firm doesn't want to find itself in. It likes to make abnormal profit. To make matters even worse, remember that because they're in such a, um, such a struggle with their competitor and they can't use one of the best things to compete on, which is price, which we just justified, then they have to spend their money on some other thing. And where that's going to be found is in product differentiation. So you'll see the firms put a lot of money into convincing people that their product is different than the other one. Think of the amount of commercials that are out there that are trying to convince you that Coke is a better choice than Pepsi or vice versa. It could be a commercial, it could be sponsorship of a team or a player or something like that. Whatever it is, it's going to take a lot of money to try to give the firm some advantage so that they can have some control over their price. But ultimately, as we've shown, because consumers don't consider the two products to be that different, this firm isn't going to have a lot of control over its price. So a drawback here is that a monopoly, yeah, they might make a lot of abnormal profit, but remember, they take that abnormal profit and they move their way down the average cost curve through research and development or something like that. But here, a lot of this abnormal profit is going to go towards product differentiation 
and you might not actually find the firm getting much more efficient over time. So the non-collusive oligopoly is negative for consumers and the price is high, but the flip side of that is that it's not really that great for the oligopoly either because they don't have as much control over price as they would like to have. If you have any questions or comments, leave them below.